A Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. This is chapter two. The nature of unconscious thought or how the other half thinks. Language functions. Language lives and breathes independently of any human subject. Speaking beings far from simply using language as a tool are also used by language. They are the playthings of language and are duped by language. Language has a life of its own. Language as other brings with it rules, exceptions, expressions, and lexicons, standard vocabularies and jargons, lingos, specialized techno-speak and subcultural dialect dialects. It evolves over time. Is history related to that of the beings who speak it, who are not simply cast and recast by it, but have an impact upon it as well, introducing new terms, new turns of phrases, or new turns of phrase, new constructions, and so on. Shakespeare has been credited with introducing into English hundreds of new metaphors and turns of phrase, and Lacan himself has had a substantial impact upon the, the French spoken by at least a significant percentage of French intellectuals, having forged original translations for many of Freud's terms and introduced many new terms and expressions of his own into French psychoanalytic discourse. Yet language also operates independently, outside of our control. While we have the feeling much of the time of choosing our words, at times they are chosen for us. We may be unable to think and express something except in one very specific way, that being the only formulation our language, or at least that part of the language we have assimilated and have as it were, at our disposal, provides, and words are occasionally blurted out that we do not have the impression of having chosen, far from it. Certain words and expressions present themselves to us while we are speaking or writing, not always the ones we want, sometimes so persistently that we are virtually forced to speak or write them before being able to move on to others. <clears throat> A certain image or metaphor may come to mind without our having sought it out or in, or in any way attempted to construct it and thrust itself upon us so forcibly that we can but reproduce it and only then try to tease out its meaning. Such expressions and metaphors are selected in some other place than consciousness. Lacan suggests that we view the, the process as one in which there are two chains of discourse which run roughly parallel to each other in a figurative sense, each unfolding and developing chronolo chronologically along a timeline, as it were, one of which occasionally interrupts or intervenes in the other. Um, we might refer to the upper line as a chain of spoken words, that is, a chain of speaking, enunciation, or enunciating, Lacan uses the word chain to remind us of the grammatical and, and contextual links between each word uttered and the ones that come before and after. No one word in a statement has any fixed value except insofar as it is used in a particular context. Lacan's approach to linguistics rebukes any strictly referential theory of language, whereby each word uttered would have a strict one-to-one -one relation with a thing existing in reality. The lower line in the figure represents the moment of unconscious thought process, thought processes, which occurs contemporaneously with the movement of speech and time, but is for the most part independent thereof. The figure is not numbered, so but is on page fifteen. In a conversation, you might be talking with a friend about a blister you got on your foot while running. The parapraxal slip to sister indicating that another thought is preoccupying you at, at some other level, at the level of the unconscious. Something your interlocutor said might have reminded you of your sister, but it might alternatively be the case that nothing in the present speech situation activated thoughts of her, and that a certain unconscious rumination had been going on since earlier in the day when you spoke to her on the phone or dreamt about her. 
How does thinking go on at the unconscious level? And what kind of thought processes occur there? In the interpretation of dreams, Freud showed that condensation and displacement are fundamental characteristics of unconscious thought processes. And Lacan went on, in the agency of the letter and the unconscious, or reason since Freud, écrit, to demonstrate the relation between condensation and metaphor on the one hand, and between displacement and metonymy on the other. Metaphor and metonymy being linguistic tropes that have been discussed at great length in works on rhetoric for centuries. Virtually every analysand is astonished early on in the analytic process in his or her initial attempts to understand dreams and fantasies by the complexity of the process that gives rise to such unconscious products or unconscious formations, as Lacan calls them. Yet Lacan went much further still in his exploration of what occurs at the unconscious level, attempting to provide models by which to concept conceptualize the autonomous functioning of language in the unconscious and the uncanny indestructibility of unconscious contents. These models were first developed during his 1954-55 to seminar, The Ego in Freud's Theory and in the Technique of Psychoanalysis, and considerably expanded in the afterward to his seminar on the purloined letter. Few attempts have yet been made to outline the ramifications of these models, and indeed, they present a view of the functioning of language that is quite unfamiliar to anyone who is not versed in computer languages or com combinatories as used in mathematics. Lacan's models begin here, not with natural languages as they are called in linguistics, languages as they are actually spoken, but with artificial languages, most notably their syn syntactic rules. The latter have a good deal to teach us about the symbolic order itself, about its stuff or substance, its relation to the reality it ostensibly describes and its byproducts. Lacan's models require a bit of mental gymnastics on our part, and it should be viewed as neither superfluous nor gratuitous, for it is perfectly in keeping with Lacan's view of the nature of unconscious thought processes, as we shall see. They involve various degrees of ciphering. Heads or tails below presents a simplified model of the language Lacan develops. And, and that model should suffice for the more conceptual discussion beginning in the subsequent section. Heads or tails. Lacan's models can be understood through the use of a simple example. These readers interested in seeing why Lacan picked these particular kinds of models are referred to chapters 15 and 16 of Seminar 2, as well as the seminar on the purloined letter and its postface. The artificial language Lacan develops takes a real event as its point of departure, the flipping of a well-balanced, unloaded coin. As we shall see, this real event could equally well be the comings and goings, alternating presence and absence of a child's mother, and is thus more than tangentially related to the Fort de game played by Freud's grandson, described in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. With such a coin, there is no way to predict, at any one toss, whether the result will be heads or tails. Following Lacan's non-arbitrary choice of plus and minus for heads and tails, a random string of toss results can be broken down in a variety of ways. Consider, for example, the following chain. So, um, first, so there's like a table. So there's toss numbers and then heads or heads or tails chain. So obviously toss, toss numbers are going to be numbered one to nine. And then the heads or tails chain is plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, 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 plus. The toss numbers refer to the first toss of the coin, the second toss, the third toss, and so on, while the heads-tails chain represents the result of each toss. Plus stands for heads and minus for tails. The rationale for referring to this string of toss throws as a chain, whereas this results, whereas their results are a priori altogether independent, 
The second thrill has the same 50-50 chance of showing up heads or tails, regardless of the result of the first throw. Derives from the fact that we proceed to group the signs by pairs along the chain. There are four possible pair combinations. Plus, plus, um, minus, minus, plus, minus, and minus, plus. So, um, so then there's another table here where they keep the toss numbers at the top but then for heads tails chains they're like pairing them so one and two are paired together three and four are paired together five and six together seven is by itself for some reason oh because it's minus 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 so i don't know i don't know why seven is by itself it doesn't it seems kind of random and then eight and nine are paired together. So, and then there's a line added called numeric matrix category. So, um, one and two paired together is plus plus. So that numeric matrix category is one. Um, three and four are paired together and that's minus minus. And the numeric matrix category is three. And then five and six are paired together. So that's plus minus, and the numeric matrix category is two, and then eight and nine are paired together, and that's minus plus. Numeric matrix category again is two. Let us assign the pair plus plus the number one. See the numeric matrix cate category line above. This is the first level of coding we are going to introduce, and it marks the origin of the symbolic system we are creating here. I will refer to this first level as our numeric matrix. The two alternating combinations, plus minus and minus plus, will be designated by the number two, and the pair minus minus will receive the designation three. Okay, and then they have, you know, that just kind of like put in a table, I guess, for easier understanding. However, a still more chain-like aspect will result if we group the toss results by overlapping pairs. Okay, so this is getting into mathematics that I... <laughs> it looks like a mathematical equation. So I don't really know how to explain this. It's on page 17. In the above chain, we see that our first element is plus plus, a combination we have decided to designate as one. Taking the second and third toss results, we have plus minus to be denoted as two. The third and fourth toss results, minus minus, constitute a three combination. The fourth and fifth toss results, minus plus, a two, and so on. Following Lacan's notation, we can write these figures just below the heads tails chain. Here, each numeric matrix category refers to the plus or minus sign directly above it. Taken in conjunction with the plus or minus sign immediately to that sign's left. Okay, so now we have another table. So heads tails chain is at the top and then numeric matrix categories at the bottom. The heads tails chain goes as follows, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, 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 plus. The numeric matrix category goes one, two, three, two, two, three, three, two. It is already clear at this point what a category one set of tosses cannot be immediately followed in the lower line, i.e. the line representing category numbers by category three set as the second throw in a category one is necessarily a plus, whereas the first throw in a category three has to be a minus. Similarly, though a category two can be followed by a one, two, or three, a category three cannot be immediately followed by a category one, for the former ends in a minus, while the latter must begin with a plus. We have thus already come up with a way of grouping tosses, a symbolic matrix, which prohibits certain combinations, like one followed by three and three followed by one. This obviously does not in the least require that a head's toss be followed by any one particular kind of toss. In reality, a head's may still just as easily be followed by another head's as by a tail's. 
We have generated an impossibility in our signifying chain, even though we have not determined the outcome of any particular toss. This amounts to a spelling rule, akin to I before E except after C. Except that the rule we have just created knows no exception. Note that most rules of spelling and grammar concern the way letters and words are strung or chained together, dictating what can and cannot precede one letter or term and what can and cannot follow it. Suppose now that we know that the first pair of tosses fell into category one and that the third pair was a category three. The series can be easily reconstructed, plus, plus, minus, minus, and we can, ha we can have no doubt but that the second pair of tosses fell into category two. If we suppose anew that we began with a one, i.e. a category one pair, and that position four, i.e. the fourth overlapping pair was occupied by a one, there are clearly only two possibilities open to us. So here's another figure. Um, so it's either one, two, two, one, or one, one, one. Um, and that translates to plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, or plus, 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 plus. And in neither of them is category three combination visible. A type three combination is in fact impossible here. It is also clear that if there are not simply ones in the numeric chain, there must be an even number of twos. If we are to ever find a one in the chain again after the first one, the first two introducing a minus sign the second, or even numbered two, moving the chain back to positive from negative. Oh, God. And then there's, there's another, um, f I don't know, table figure, whatever. On page 18, you might want to check it out, I guess. Here the chain prohibits the appearance of a second one <clears throat> until an even number of twos has turned up. In this sense, we may say that the chain remembers or keeps track of its previous components. The example found in Lacan's afterward is far more complicated than the one I have provided here, as it groups the coin tosses into triplets instead of pairs, and proceeds to superimpose upon them a second symbolic matrix, the simpler 1-2-3 matrix described above. Results in impossibilities related to the order in which the category numbers can appear as well as to which of them can appear as certain positions are predefined and records within itself or records within itself or remembers its previous components. Thus, we have at our disposal a simple symbolic coin toss overlay, which suits our needs for it not only comports an elementary, though consequent grammar, but a built-in built -in memory function as well, primitive as it may be. A restriction in terms of possibility and impossibility has arisen. It seems ex nihilo. Important too, though, is the syntax produced, which allows certain combinations and prohibits others. The similarities between this kind of apparatus and language will be explored further on. Randomness and memory. Now, what is the point of Lacan's ciphering? As I mentioned above, Lacan is interested in seminar two and the postface to the seminar on the purloined letter in constructing a symbolic system that brings with it a syntax, a set of rules of laws that is not inherent in the pre-existing reality. The resulting possibilities and impossibilities can thus be seen to derive from the way in which the symbolic matrix is, matrix is constructed that is the way it ciphers the event in question. It is not so much the fact of ciphering in this particular instance as the method of ciphering which gives rise to laws, syntactic laws, that were not already there. The method of ciphering Lacan employs here is by no means the simplest imaginable, and a far simpler method yields no syntax whatsoever, but his method seems to significantly mimic the ciphering of natural languages in dream processes. Let us note another feature of the symbolic system Lacan develops. I have shown above that the numeric chains keep track of numbers, that in a certain sense they count them, not allowing one to appear before enough of the others, or certain combinations of the others, have joined the chain. This keeping track of or counting constitutes a type of memory. The past is recorded in the chain itself, determining what is yet to come. 
Lacan points out that the remembering in question in the unconscious, and I mean the Freudian unconscious, is not the same as that assumed to be involved in memory, insofar as this latter would be the property of a living being. The implication here is twofold. In the first place, gray matter, or the nervous system as a whole, is incapable of accounting for the eternal and indestructible nature of unconscious contents. Matter seems to behave in such a way as to necessarily lead to a gradual decay or decrease in the amplitude or quality of impressions. It cannot be the guarantor of their everlastingness. And in the second place, rather than, rather than being remembered by the individual, in an active way, i.e. with some sort of subjective participation, things are remembered for him or her by the signifying chain. As Lacan says in the seminar on the purloined letter, such is the case of the man who retreats to an island to forget. What he has forgotten, such is the case of the minister, who by not using the letter winds up forgetting it, but the letter no more than the neurotic's unconscious does not forget him. We see here a clear connection between the letter, or signifying chain, and the unconscious. The unconscious cannot forget, composed of letters working as they do in an autonomous, automatic way. It preserves in the present what has affected it in the past, eternally holding on to each and every element, remaining forever marked by all of them. For the moment, the links of this constituting order that is the symbolic are as, are as concerns what Freud constructs as concerns what Freud constructs regarding the indestructibility of what his unconscious conserves, the only ones that can be suspected of doing the trick. The unconscious assembles. This characterization of unconscious thought was by no means a passing fancy of Lacan's representative at best of his structuralist years. In seminar 20, Lacan says that in his vocabulary, the letter designates an assemblage, or rather letters make up assemblages, not simply designating, designating them. They are assemblages. They are to be taken as functioning as assemblages themselves. He later adds, the unconscious is structured like the assemblages in question in set theory, which are like letters. Freud has accustomed psychoanalysts to the notion that thinking as we commonly understand it plays a far small, smaller role in the determination of human action than previously thought. We may believe, feel, and claim that we have done A for reason B, or when we seem unable to immediately explain our behavior, we grope around for ad hoc explanations, rationalizations. Psychoanalysis seems, in a sense, to intervene by asserting the existence of reason C, which we had not even considered or had been deliberately ignoring, not to mention the flood of ulterior motives, D, E, and F, which slowly but surely raised their ugly heads in the course of analytic work. But this is to liken unconscious thought processes to, to conscious ones, whereas Lacan insists instead upon a dichotomy. Conscious thought is grounded in the realm of meaning and is striving to make sense of the world. Lacan proposes that unconscious processes have little, if anything, whatsoever to do with meaning. We can, it seems, completely ignore the whole issue of meaning. That is, the whole of what, what Lacan calls the signified or signification in discussing the unconscious. According to Lacan, the unconscious is structured like a language, and a natural language, unlike speech, is structured like a formal language. As Jacques-Alain Miller says, the structure of language is, in a radical sense, ciphering. The type of ciphering or coding Lacan engages in when he superimposes numeric and alphabetic ma matrices on chains of pluses and minuses, altogether akin to the type of ciphering used in the machine language assembler to go from open and closed circuit paths to something resembling a language with which one can program. To Lacan's mind, the unconscious consists in chains of quasi-mathematical inscriptions, and borrowing a notion from Bertrand Russell, who in speaking of mathematicians said that the symbols they were with they were they work with don't mean anything. There is thus no point talking about the meaning of unconscious formations or productions. The kind of truth unveiled by psychoanalytic work can thus be understood to have nothing whatsoever to do with meaning 
and while Lacan's mathematical games may seem to be merely recreational, his belief was that an, an analyst gains a certain agility in working them through, in deciphering them, and in discovering the logic behind them. It is the kind of deciphering activity required by any and every encounter with the unconscious, language in the unconscious and as the unconscious ciphers. Analysis thus entails a significant deciphering process that results in truth, not meaning. Consider, for example, Lacan's enthusiasm in Seminar 21, or no, sorry, Seminar 11, <laughs> duh, 11, over Serge Leclerc's reconstruction of the assemblage poured, poured jelly as the key to the whole configuration of unconscious desire and identification in one of his patients. Though letters themselves are not decomposed in this example, it is clear that while we can provide glosses accounting for specific elements, the assemblage as a whole, for example, the order of its components and the logic of its construction, remains as impenetrable as a dream's navel. According to Lacan, Leclerc was able to isolate the unicorn sequence, which is poor jelly, <laughs> not as what's suggested in the discussion following his talk and its dependence on meaning, but precisely in its irreducible and insane character as a chain of signifiers. Here is elsewhere in the same seminar, Lacan notes that interpretation does not so much aim at revealing meaning as at reducing signifiers to their non-meaning, lack of meaning, so as to find the determinants of the whole of the subject's behavior. Interpretation brings forth an irreducible signifier, irreducible signifying elements. What must be glimpsed by the analysand beyond the meaning inherent in interpretation itself is the signifier, which has no meaning and is irreducible and traumatic, to which he as subject is subjected. Let us consider a better known example, Freud's rat man. As a child, the rat man identified with rats as biting creatures that are often treated cruelly by humans, he himself having been severely beaten by his father for having bitten his nurse. Certain ideas then become part of the rat complex due to meaning. Rats can spread diseases such as syphilis, just like a man's penis. Hence, rat equals penis. But other ideas become grafted onto the rat complex due to the word ratten itself, not its meanings. Ratten means installments, and later to the equation of rats and florins. Spiel rat means gambler, and the rat man's father, having incurred a debt gambling, becomes drawn into the rat complex. Freud refers to these links as verbal bridges. They have no meaning per se, deriving entirely from literal relations among words, insofar as they give rise to symptomatic acts involving payment for the pince nay father's debt. It is the signifier itself that subjugates the rat man, not meaning. Let us assume that the latter overheard a snatch of his parents' conversation, including Spielrat, and though he was still too young to understand it, it was nevertheless recorded, indelibly etched in his memory. There it took on a life of its own, forming links with other purloined letters, scenes witnessed and words overheard not intended for his eyes or ears. His unconscious was irre irremediably transformed by what he heard, and what you hear is the signifier, not meaning. Here the signifier is not so much signifying, devoted to making sense, as nonsensical substance. Meaning in this example, like subjective involvement in the choice of symptom, as discussed in chapter 1, is only constituted after the fact. knowledge without a subject. Once the structure of language is recognized in the unconscious, what sort of subject can we conceive of for it? Um, that was from Lacan from Ecri. There is perfectly well articulated knowledge for which no subject is, strictly speaking, responsible. That was Lacan from sem Seminar 17. Now this way of conceptualizing the unconscious apparently leaves no room for a subject of any kind. There's a type of structure automatically and autonomously unfolded in as the unconscious, and there's absolutely no need to postulate any kind of consciousness of this automatic movement. 
Lacan, in any case, breaks with the association made by so many philosophers of subjectivity and consciousness. The unconscious contains indelible knowledge, which at the same time is absolutely not subjectivized. The unconscious is not something one knows, but rather something that is known. What is unconscious is known unbeknownst to the person in question. It is not something one actively, consciously grasps, but rather something that is passively registered, inscribed, or counted. And this unknown knowledge is locked into the connection between signifiers. It consists in the very connection. This kind of knowledge has no subject, nor does it need one. And yet Lacan speaks constantly about the subject, the subject of the unconscious, of unconscious desire, the subject in the phantasmatic relation to object A, A, and so on. Where can the subject possibly fit in? Before turning to that question to be discussed in part two of this book, I take up in the next chapter the overriding importance of the symbolic order for speaking beings.